We are now live. Okay, so we're going to talk about chapter nine. which is called producing data. Okay? Now, we've, there are two main types of ways to collect data. One is called an observational study. And one is called an experiment. Okay? So the idea with an observational study, oh, we're off camera already. You guys couldn't even tell me. What kind of cameraman are you guys? All right, now we go. <laughs> okay, maybe I will help turn those TVs on in the back. Um, all right, so the idea with an observational is you observe and measure and you don't attempt to influence, okay? So that was kind of like our, our example where we did the BYU-Utah thing. I said no campaigning. We just want to know what your opinions are, okay? With an experiment, you deliberately, deliberately impose a treatment in order to observe a response. Okay? So a lot of your homework questions are going to ask you um, if this is an observational study or if it is an experiment. Okay? So, let's, let me give you an example, and I want you to tell me if you think this is a, an experiment or an observational study. So we'll just vote when I want to get done with this. Okay, so let me read this. A Danish study kept track of 420,095 cell phone users between 1982 and 1995, okay? So they compared the rate of brain tumors of people with cell phones versus people without cell phones. And they wanted to see if there were a difference in the number of brain tumors between those two groups, okay? So you've got 420,000 uh, cell phone users and we're comparing the ones with tumors and the ones without tumors. Sorry. We're comparing the tumors in the ones with cell phones and the tumors with the ones without cell phones. Okay? So is that an observational study or is it an experiment? So let's vote. We're going to vote. Okay? Who thinks that was an observational study? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Most of them, who thinks it was an experiment? I have a question. Okay, question. So with the experiment, is it like the same thing as what you would do with the experiment? Like you would observe the brain tumors and then you would compare your results to the treatment, or is that only within the study? Or within the survey? So you're asking about an experiment in general, okay? Here, let me answer this question and then I'll answer your question. Okay? So you were right. We didn't force people to use cell phones. Okay? We, let, we just let them choose whether they wanted cell phones or not. Okay? So, yes, you're correct. This was an observational study. Okay? Now, if we wanted to make an experiment, here's what we could have done. We could have done, okay, I'm going to split this class in half. You guys have to use cell phones every day, and you guys cannot use cell phones every day. Okay? Come back in 10 years when you see who's right to Who wants to sign up? Okay? Better yet, usually the example I give is, okay, you guys have to smoke. You guys can't smoke. We're going to see who gets lung cancer. Okay? 
that would be an experiment. Because I would therefore force you to use a cell phone or force you to smoke or force you to do something. Okay? And so that's so yes, I could make a cell phone experiment, but in this case, we just let people, if you want a cell phone, you use it. Does that make sense? Tell me your name? Yeah. Sam, okay? So what if it's like people that already smoke and use cell phones, and then people that already don't smoke, but there are these things as an experiment? What do you guys think? If people smoke or use cell phones versus people who smoke or don't use cell phones, is that an experiment? Now, it's an observational study. You let people do whatever they want to do, and they'll do whatever they do, and then you compare them. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, I guess I'll, I'll give you the answer here. There's a problem with that. Okay. What'd you say? Well, that could be a that, 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 privacy could be a problem, but it's not the problem I was going for. I'm going to give you the answer here in just a minute. You wouldn't have equal groups, so like if you're just talking to an average, it's unlikely that you're going to have equal groups of, say, smokers and non-smokers, so you're finding something. Yeah, there, there could be an issue of equal group size. Um, theoretically, you could get around that, and with, with an experiment, you can get around it, but with an observational study, generally speaking, you're going to have unequally sized groups. Yeah, that, that's good. Comments? There's no control. There's no control. Okay. So the idea here is the problem with this is we have confounding, confounding, and we have lurking variables. Oh, these two concepts are related. That's why I'm going to teach them to you at basically the same time. Lurking variables. Okay. Now, my favorite definition of a lurking variable is what you forgot to include in your study. Okay? And that leads to, a lurking variable leads to confounding. Okay, a couple definitions I like for confounding are... Um, the good definition is the effect of two or more variables is, excuse me, are not separated. And this often leads to conflicting results. Okay? Now the fact of the matter is, well, maybe I should give you this example. Well, here I'll finish my sentence. The fact of the matter is, people who smoke are different than people who don't smoke. Okay? And they're different in ways that you don't recognize. Okay? So let me give you a, a for, an, uh, for an example. So back in the 1960s, they did a study, and they said that people who eat more sugar get more heart disease. Then there was another study done, and they said there's no link between sugar and heart disease. Okay? So you've got some confounding going on. You've got some conflicting results. Okay? Now, the reason why these, were, these results were conflicting was because, did you know that smokers consume more sugar than non-smokers? Who knew that? Okay. Now, why would that be? Now, let's think back for a minute. This is the 1960s. Starbucks does not exist. Okay. So in the 1960s, you couldn't go to Starbucks and get a really good taste in coffee. Because the fact that it is, I'm not a coffee drinker, by the way, but I have heard, and I've smelled coffee, and it tastes it smells nasty to I would not be a coffee drinker. But some of you probably like coffee and think it tastes great. But back in the 1960s, you'd get a black cup of coffee, and it would taste nasty, and so what you'd do is you'd pour some sugar in it. 
community based on. Okay? The delusion of Starbucks. Do that for you. Okay? So it turns out that people who smoked, smoking indulge in taste buds. And coffee tastes nasty, just black. And so smokers would pour a lot more sugar in their coffee so that they could taste the sugar than non smokers. And so the idea was the first study had a lurking variable. The lurking variable was do you smoke? They didn't ask that question. All they did was they noticed that, so it turns out that we had some confounding going on. The effects of two or more, more variables were not separate. The smokers ate more sugar, or I should rather say drank more sugar than non-smokers. Okay? And so when they thought it was sugar causing the heart disease, it wasn't really the sugar, it was the smoking. Okay? Because they couldn't they couldn't separate the sugar from the smoking. Okay? And so that's why I like to call lurking variables what you forgot to include in your study. Because before five minutes ago, did you know that smokers consume more sugar than non-smokers? Okay? That's not something that you would normally think of, right? Okay? And so the problem with observational studies, tying this back, is you have a lot of lurking variables. You don't know why people choose to smoke. But those reasons are different. Okay? And so you have a lot of lurking variables and a confounding going on because of those lurking variables. Does that make sense? Okay? Yes. Would medical history and age also be lurking variables, or do you assume that they're going to be connected? Okay. Age and gender are also two very important lurking variables. Okay. Women often react different to drugs than men do, especially in drug studies. Um, back also in the 1960s, they found this drug, I'm trying to remember what it was called. There was a great Freakonomics episode on it, but um, it, it, it helped people go to sleep. Or no, it helped people with nausea, I think it was. And so women, when you're pregnant, a lot of times you have nausea. So they said, here, take this drug. I may not remember the name of it. Anyway, so women took this drug and all of a sudden had babies born without arms and legs. Flimide, I think it is flimide. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. But anyway, so it was some drug. And so... Um, what the drug companies did was they said, okay, we don't want to cause birth defects. This is horrible problem. No women can be in our studies. Okay? Because we don't want to have problems with birth defects. So the problem with that knee-jerk reaction was, okay, now we've got all these drugs that have only been tried on men. Are they okay for pregnant women? Don't know. Okay? And so, so experiments can be a problem as well. Um, let me go back here. I want to, um, oh, I have some good podcasts. Maybe I'll, if you guys want to listen to some of this. Let me ask you, let me give you another example. I want to go back here for observational studies and experiments for a moment. I want to ask you if this is an observational study or if this is an experiment. Researchers want to know if a certain drug cures the common cold. They divide the subjects into two groups. Half of the subjects are given a new drug, and half of the subjects are given a fake pill. The results on who recovers from the cold are compared. Is this an experiment or an observational study? Who says it's an observational study? Nobody who says it's an experiment. Okay? All right, you got that one right. Okay, so the idea, a lot of times, experiments are preferred over observational studies because you can get, you can control your lurking variables a whole lot more, okay? But in some cases, it's not ethical to do an experiment. So, for example, let's pretend I don't know if smoking causes cancer, or maybe I think it might. 
would it be ethical for me to force half the room to smoke and half the room not to smoke and then come back in 30 years? Would it be ethical? Okay. So the problem is a lot of times we can't do experiments for ethical reasons. And so we have to rely on observational studies. And smoking is a good example. And it's also why tobacco has had such a great time because they've always had to rely on comparing smokers to non-smokers. They've always had to rely on observational studies. And the tobacco company said, well, there could be lurking variables. So that's why it took so long for the United States to get enough of these observational studies to say, yes, smoking causes cancer. We have enough evidence. Okay? Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about different types of observational studies. Okay? So, observational studies. Okay? Number one, we have cross-sectional studies. Okay. Two, we have case control studies. And three, we have cohort studies. Okay. Oh, what happened to my thing? Oh, we're back in focus. I wonder, can you see better on the TV if I turn these lights out? Is that better or worse? Who wants the lights on? Okay, we'll leave them off then. All right, so cross-sectional studies. Are you Francisco? Yes. All right. Um, let me finish this and then I'll let you get it. All right. So the idea with the cross cross sectional study is you collect info over a short time period. It's cheap and easy. Okay. So let's say, for example, I wanted to find out if, so let's we'll pretend that you're my cross-sectional survey. I want to find out who has cancer in this class, okay? So I'm going to do a quick survey. It would take me probably about a minute or two. I do a cross-sectional study, and I say, who has cancer? Hopefully everybody says, I do not have cancer in this class, okay? I did my study. It's quick, it was easy, I collected my info over a short period of time. What the problem is, okay, all of you tell me you don't have cancer. Tomorrow you have your doctor's appointment, you go to the doctor, and you find out you have cancer. You didn't know that today, okay? And so the, the problem with the cross-sectional study, because it is cheap and easy, sometimes you can miss it. Uh, events. So you really had cancer, you just didn't know it today because I collected it over a short period of time. And when we talk short period of time, we're talking a week, a month, a year. Okay? Another thing that we have is what we call a case control study. It is retrospective. Okay? Retrospective means we look back in time. Okay, and the idea here is, let's say, for example, you've got two people. We'll pick on uh, I need to your name. Haley and Min. So we're going to pick on Haley and Min. Haley has cancer. Min does not have cancer. Okay, Haley is the case. Min is what we call the control. Okay. We're trying to find out why does Haley have cancer, why does Min not have cancer, okay? So we're going to look back. They're co-workers. Um, Haley smokes and Min does not. Ah, maybe that's what causes the cancer. Or Haley goes skydiving all the time and Min just is at home all the time, whatever. Okay? We're going to look back in our history 
and we're going to see what are the differences, okay? So the idea is you compare your cases versus the controls and look for differences, okay? So the problem with the case control study is you're going to have memory problems. Okay? If we were doing a diet study, and I said, how many fruits and vegetables do you eat? You're all going to tell me you eat more than you really do. Okay? And so you're going to have memory problems with the case control study. The cohort is what we call prospective, which means you look forward in time. It's also the most expensive, and it's probably the best. Okay? Sometimes these can last decades. Okay? The nice thing about a prospective study, a cohort study, is we take two people, and your name is? Corinne and? CJ. CJ. So we take Corinne and CJ, we ask you to keep a journal of what did you eat today, and then we can look, oh, Corinne eats salads every day, and CJ eats meat all the time, no wonder you got colon cancer. Okay? And so, this is nice because you don't have the memory problems from looking back in time. You look forward in time, but it's also very expensive to collect that data. Okay? So, not quite done yet. Okay. So, here's what I would like to do Francisco is here, and he is going to help us in our class. And um, so, as far as, as homework, what I'm going to give. The rest of the time, Francisco, he's going to tell you all about what he can do. But as far as homework's going to be concerned, we finished chapter eight. We've done about half of chapter nine today. So I'm going to give you a quiz on kind of a hybrid of what we've covered in chapter nine so far and the rest of eight uh, on Tuesday. So Tuesday, the homework that's due is chapter eight. We'll make nine due on Thursday, and we'll probably do nine this time. So, Francisco, take it away. And if you want to stand in front of our camera so they can know who you are, we're recording this. And so for people who aren't here, you can meet Francisco. So I just want to introduce myself to everyone. My name is Francisco. Uh, I'm the SI leader for all of the 1040 and 1045 classes for UVU. So uh, just to introduce myself, I'm a stats major here. I'm a senior. And the SI program, has anyone had an SI class before? Do you want to kind of explain it about what goes on during it? Uh, sure. Um, usually there's like SI sessions. Um, the SI leader will um, take charge of and like go over things we want to class and things we have problems with or issues with. And you're always usually there for like questions and stuff. So, so essentially it's like kind of blocked off like uh, review session times for stuff like this. So this is completely for your benefit, completely optional. It's up to you. But I'll be there. We'll do different activities, help you guys learn more of the content, help you guys become better students just in general and stuff like that. Um, I know a lot of you have seen the announcement I put on Canvas. I'm, I'm not sure if you've mentioned that in the class, but I put an announcement on you guys' Canvas earlier in the week, uh, letting me know like when you guys would want to have SI sessions. So I know some of you have filled it out, but if you can fill it out, just let me know. Uh, we'll be doing it probably three, maybe four times a week, depending on uh, how many like different times people can have it. But if you can fill that out, just let me know when you guys would want to have that happen. That'd be great. So let me just say this is a hard class, and Francisco is going to be an awesome help. So I would go to them, especially if you're struggling. Uh, they will not be recorded. I'm not. I'm not as tech savvy as all of this is going on. A lot of it is going to be very like hands-on stuff. I want to do like a lot of different activities to kind of help people learn in that kind of way. So I'm, I'm going to try to get it at all different times throughout the week, like 
try to get like one morning, one night, kind of like a middle of the day type of one, just so it's like, depending on what your schedule is and what your life is, you can have at least a chance to come every now and then. So again, completely optional. It's up to you guys. It's a really big help. Again, this uh, SI courses, the only ones they have them in are courses that they've identified that students either really struggle in or there's a high drop rate. So I'm here to this help you guys pass. For both in this class. So does anyone else have any questions? Sweet. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks. So see you all on Tuesday. Quiz will be the rest of 8 and the beginning of 9. Thank <laughs> you.